what is up stack and ohana's aloha stacker and welcome back to the channel and to another video and in today's video we're going to be talking about john wayne we've got our ten dollar a week challenge week 21 and we've got some really cool pickups that i got from uh, guido stacken's last auction uh, on our previous monday so with that that is what i've got to show off today i, I want to show off my new uh, desk setup too so there's my new setup as you know we got the awesome new one kilo libertad we got the uh, reverse proof we got the beautifully uncirculated I uh, got a nice statue of King Kamehameha here on the desk. Uh, got my Shaka magnet. I've got my Aloha. So, and I also now have a place to permanently put my pour of the month and my uh, ten dollar week challenge coin. So that is pretty awesome. So that is the new setup. I hope you like it. I also left a little area over here to show off new coins that come out from the previous week, or gifts, or whatever, and they'll be there for the next for the. Pre uh, next video and then they'll, I'll move them on to, I'll change them out as we get new items. But let's go ahead and talk about John Wayne. And I wanna show you a couple really cool coins that I got from an Instagram seller. And the first one is this one right here. Take a look at this. Courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. Now that is an awesome quote. Now that is a beautiful coin. Now this is the John Wayne one ounce coin from Tuvalu, 2021. Four nines fine, silver, one ounce. This is an absolutely beautiful coin. Now there's only 15,000 of these beautifully uncirculated coins minted. And I've got myself one of them because I am a huge John Wayne fan and I'm a huge cowboy fan. I love cowboy, any movies with cowboys, westerns I, is my thing, I love it. And uh, this is one of the coins that for this episode. But this is not all I got. I got one that's even cooler than this one. And as we know, not everybody likes these all the time, but check a look at this. We've got a colorized version of the same coin and there's only 2,500 of these minted, period. Now there's another version of this where they put it inside a card and there's a thousand of those cards printed, but uh, I didn't know about that when I got this, so I got this one, but I'm happy with this. I really, really like this coin. Look at the detail on the colorization of this coin. You cannot tell me that this is absolutely stunning. Let me see if I can bring it closer. There we go. That is the Duke himself, sitting on the horse. Looks like he's got his Winchester uh, rifle. Uh, just absolutely stunning. I love this coin, this is so beautiful. And this one, the only colorization here is on the John Wayne side. So this is it right here. This is an absolutely gorgeous coin. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and do a quick biography read of John Wayne, because believe it or not, this guy was a true legend of his era. And I'm going to explain to you why. And in fact, I'm going to leave, I'm going to keep this coin here, uh, showing it off while I read. So you can take a look at it. Or would you prefer to see that? Actually, you know what we couldn't do? Maybe we can put John Wayne on one side and John Wayne on the other side. That way you can admire the beautiful Lever Todds while I read this. And that would be pretty cool, right? So John Wayne, by name Duke. His original name was Marion Michael Morrison. He was born May 26, 1907 in Winterset, Iowa. He died June 11th, 1979 in Los Angeles, California. He's a major American motion picture actor who embodied the image of a strong, taciturn cowboy or soldier who in many ways personified and idealized the American values of the era. Marion Morrison was the son of an Iowa pharmacist. He acquired the nickname Duke during his youth and billed himself as Duke Morrison for one of his early films. In 1925, he enrolled at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, where he played football. He worked summers at the Fox Film Corporation as a prop man and developed a friendship with director John Ford, who cast him in some small film roles starting in 1928. His first leading role and his first appearance as John Wayne came in director Raoul Walsh's The Big Trail, 1930. During the next year, eight years, Wayne started more than 60 low-budget motion pictures, mostly in roles as cowboys, soldiers, and other rugged men of adventure. He reached genuine star stature when Ford cast him as the Ringo Kid in the classic western Stagecoach, 1939. After that film, his place in American cinema was established and grew with each successive year. Ford's Long Voyage Home 1940, a film based on several Eugene O'Neill one-act plays, featured one of Wayne's most praised performances from the early years of his stardom and offered, and offered further evidence of his commanding screen presence. Speculation exists as to whether Wayne purposely avoided military service during World War II, but evidence suggests that his attempts to enlist in the Navy were rejected because of his age, an old football injury, and a federal government directive to draft boards to go easy on actors whose talents could be used for building morale. He spent the war years entertaining troops overseas and making films such as popular action adventures, Flying Tigers, 1942, The Fighting Seabees, 1944, They Were Expendable, 1945, and Back to Bataan, 
1945, all of which featured Wayne as quintessentially American fighting men who overcome great odds. He also appeared during this period in melodramas such as The Spoilers, 1942, The Flame of Barbary Coast, 1945. By the end of the war, Wayne had firmly established Wayne was firmly established as one of Hollywood's top stars. Wayne's screen image was permanently defined in many classic films he made with directors Ford and Howard Hawks during the post-war years and into the early 60s. For Ford, Wayne starred in what came to be known as the Cavalry Trilogy, Ford Apache 1948, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon 1949, and Rio Grande 1950. Three Egliac films in which Wayne portrays stoic cavalry officers of the Old West. Wayne's roles in these and other films for Ford offer a somewhat complex representation of the American character in that they exhibit unflying patriotism. In this manner, Ford Wayne films both honor and undermine the mythology of the Old West, nowhere more than in The Searchers, 1956, a film considered by some to be the greatest Western ever made. Wayne's character in the film pursues noble goal, rescuing his kidnapped niece from a renegade Comanche leader. But his obsessive behavior and blatant bigotry reveal him to be mad as he is heroic. Ford's exploration of the dark underbelly of the Old West legends culminated in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, 1962, a film that both questions and justifies that when the truth interferes with the legend, print the legend, philosophy of the 19th century journalists of the American West. In all, Ford Wayne film presents an Old West rendered obsolete by the very society it helped create. Wayne also appeared in films for Ford that were not Westerns, including standouts such as The Quiet Man, 1952, and Donovan's Reef, 1963. Howard Hawks' collaboration with Wayne are less iconoclastic than Ford's, but no less revered. Red River, 1948, another candidate for greatest Western films of all time, features Wayne as an auto autocratic, mono monomaniacal cattle baron at odds with an orphan boy he reared portrayed in adulthood by Montgomery Cliff in his first screen role and the modern values he represents. Wayne did not work with Hawks again until Rio Bravo 1959, a film born of Hawks and Wayne's dissatisfaction with the popularity of High Noon 1952, with Gary Cooper, Western in which citizens of a Western community are portrayed as weak, willed, and cowardly when their sheriff asks their help for forming a posse. The sheriff portrayed by Wayne in Rio Bravo conversely is determined to do his duty with or without help from anyone. Although greeted with lukewarm reviews upon its release, Rio Bravo is now regarded as a classic Western. Hawks and Wayne remade essentially the story, the same story twice in El Dorado in 1967 and in Rio Lobo in 1970, Hawks' final film. Wayne's standout films from other directors include Sansa Iwo Jima 1949, in which his performance as an uncompromisingly tough Marine sergeant earned an Oscar nomination, Hondo 1953, perhaps the only classic Western filmed in 3D, The Alamo 1960, an epic length film that Wayne himself directed and in which he starred as Davy Crockett. The Longest Day, 1962, and In Harm's Way, 1965, two hugely successful World War II epics, and McClintock, 1963, a slapstick Western farce that was his only successful comedy. After a screen career of more than 40 years, Wayne was honored with an Academy Award for his portrayal of the drunken, cantankerous, but enduring U.S. Ro Marshal Rooster Cogburn in True Git, 1969, and a role he reprised opposite Catherine Hepburn in Rooster Cogburn, 1975, a partial remake of the Hepburn-Humphrey Bogart classic, The African Queen, 1951. Wayne's final film, The Shootist, 1976, in which he portrays an aging gunfighter who is dying of cancer, was praised by many as his best Western since Rio Bravo. This role was his poignant screen farewell as the actor for whom self would succumb to cancer three years later. So that is a brief uh, history of John Wayne and the roles he, and the roles he uh, led in Hollywood, and it's pretty amazing. The man has uh, done many, many movies, and I've watched so many of them, and I just love the Western, uh, I love the Western theme. So with that, let's go ahead and move on to the Week 21 $10 Week Challenge. And for that, let me go ahead and bust this capsule open so we can show off this really neat coin. And what we ha what do we have here? Well, we have here a 1988 Canadian silver dollar. And it says, The Forges of St. Maurice Ironworks. And it's the 250th anniversary. Now, on this side, of course, we have the Queen. So we'll give a quick look at that. But we'll return back to the actual uh, coin. Let me clean that off real fast. Sorry, didn't mean to touch it. Okay, there we go. Gone. So this coin uh, had a mintage of 259,230 in the proof and 106,702 in the beautifully uncirculated. It's 50% silver or 0.375 ounces. It's half copper, half silver. And uh, I have a little, uh, I have actually a little history of the St. Maurice Ironworks that I'll read to you real fast. This one's not as long as John Wayne, I promise. So the Les Forges they, uh, of St. Maurice. The most technically advanced ironworks in America in their first hundred years, the forges had long been obsolete when shut down in 1883. The plant employed over 100 specialized craftsmen and 300 to 400 laborers and produced forged iron and molded products such as pots, pans, and stoves. 
So Las Forges, St. Maurice or St. Forge, St. Maurice Forges from Canada's first he, where they they were Canada's first heavy industry. The St. Maurice iron ore deposits near the Trois Rivers or the Three Rivers were developed by a second company endowed with a monopoly, 25 March 1730, and state subsidies after an earlier company had failed. Iron production began in 1738 and continued more or less uninterruptedly until the forges closed in the late 19th century. Bankruptcy of the company's director, F.E. Cugnet, led the state takeover in 1742, and the Treaty of Paris 1763 ownership passed to the British crown. The ironworks were then run by leases, or by lessees, or lessees, sorry, the most important being Matthew Bell in the years 1800 to 1845. The most technically advanced ironworks of America in their first hundred years, the forges had long been obsolete when they were shut down in 1883. The plant, oh, okay, I already read that part. <laughs> Never mind, that was the that was the very first part. Uh, so, uh, let me go see. Experiments with steel making and cannon founding in 1747 were not fruitful. The workforce originally from the iron producing regions of Burgundy developed a distinctive community living in Canada's first company town. In 1973, the St. Marie's Forges became a national historic park and ar archaeological research continues on the site. So yeah, it seems like, oh, so on this it actually repeats itself with about the original 100 years and the 300, 400 labor. Sorry, sorry to have repeated that, but no big deal. That's basically it for the the fire the ironworks. This is my week ten uh, week twenty one coin of the uh, of the week, and it replaces, as you know, this coin right here, which was the I think it was Detroit, right? Oh uh, yeah, the Davis Strait. So that was the uh, Davis Strait coin. So that will now move out, and we'll move the ironworks in for the next week. And one thing about the uh, ten dollar week challenge is that this is this this is it for my Canadian coins. This is the end of my Canadian coins that I have, uh, that I had pre-purchased and ready to go. So what I think I'm going to do is this is going to be my last $10 week challenge. I'm going to move to the $15 week challenge starting next Sunday. Uh, hopefully I get some coins that I ordered in that were around that price range. So that way I can um, start working on that. I think $10 a week is hard to do when you don't have an LSCS you can regularly go to. So it will be easier for me to move up to $15 a week and see what I can come up with. Now, if I struggle with that, I may just have to drop the challenge altogether, uh, but we will see. I'll give it a shot, see where we can go with that. So moving on, I have one more uh, set of coins I want to show off to you, and these are from Guido Stacken. And there's Guido Stacken's really cool new logo and holographic sticker. And the first coin that I have to show off that I was able to acquire was this. This is a 2017 Chi Wu Qian Wang, and this is a South Korean coin minted by Comsco Mint. Now this coin only had a 50,000 uh, mintage. It's the second issue, which I'm guessing is the second year uh, of the coin. I think they started this series in 2016, so this is the 2017. And what we have here is the this is the uh, Qian Cheng Wu in military dress, with his spear and shield on a horse. And on this side, we have the Qian Chu Cheng Wang shield, uh, with Comsco Mint written across the bottom. It also says 2017. Fine silver, three nines fine, Republic of Korea, one clay. And if you notice, the 999, if you shift the direction, it says AG. See that? 999. Let's see if I can shift it to make it. It's hard to do, so there we go. There's AG right there. 999. And then if we shift it that way, well, it's not enough light. So, But you can see it right there. So there's the AG. And that's really cool. I love that security features of this coin. That is really, really neat. So that is this coin. This coin had a mintage of 50,000, as I said before. Okay, so this is a 50,000 mintage. So I was able to acquire this from, uh, this actually I got from Guido's auction, not from his Buy It Now segment at the end. I thought it was really cool. Uh, it's got a very antique look to it, even though I think this is the way they made the coin, to be honest with you, because I couldn't find a specific type that said it was our, that they made these in an antique version. So I believe that this is just the way it comes, but it's awesome. And it's got this weird blue toning around the sides, which is really, really neat. I love the colorization of this. It's just so cool. And this is my first piece of, of silver from the Korean Mint. I only have one piece of gold from them, and now I have one piece of silver. So that sounds perfect to me. So we'll go ahead and set that right there. Let's go ahead and look at the three other coins I got. And these are all Canadian silver dollars. And I actually got all of these at spot. So the first one is in 1989. Now these are just now these are just standard bullion coins. They're scratched up. They're, you know, they're not, they're not heavily damaged or anything. They're just, you know, they just look circulated, really. So this is a 1989 Canadian silver dollar, and the 1989 had a 3,332,200 mintage. And then if we flip it over, we can see the Canadian maple leaf on the back. It's four nines fine silver. It says one ounce, and you got the English on one side and French on the other, where it says Argent Pur, which is pure silver in French. And so that's pretty, so that is pretty neat. So that's a 1989. I believe this is the second year of the uh, Canadian silver dollar. I think 1988 was the first year. Uh, someone get me if I'm wrong. It's either 87 or 88, but it's pretty close to the first year of the, uh, and what's one cool thing is if you look at the image of Queen Elizabeth, now I'm going to show you the second one he sent me, and this is a 2000. And this 2000 has an aged queen, right? This time she's wearing a pretty hefty crown too. 
Now this one's unique because on this side, there is a privy mark with fireworks, which is what they did in 2000 to celebrate the, uh, the new millennium. And this one had a mintage of 403,652. So if you see people weren't buying silver in 2000 by the comparison of 1989. Let me see something real quick. I actually just thought of something. Oh no, so I was thinking that that one said three nines fine, but no, it says four nines fine. So that's pretty cool. So look at, you got fireworks with a 2000 privy on it. So that's pretty neat. Once again, this is just another circulated edition. Nothing, nothing, nothing crazy so I can touch it freely. Now the third one he sent was 2009, which is the more modern uh, aged queen on it. And this one is the same. You know, there's nothing spectacular. Uh, I wish Canada would actually change up its logo at some point, um, or at least, you know, without not just doing privies and stuff, but actually change it. Maybe it's time for, for an update because they haven't changed it since the beginning. The same, it's the same maple leaf on the back. It looks exactly the same as day one as it does today. And this one had a mintage of, this 2009 had a mintage of 9,727,592. So you can see that the mintages have increased again, which means that uh, people are starting to collect these coins again or are starting to buy them in bulk. So I got three coins, all at spot, which I believe at the time was like $25.80. So I won these during his auction, actually, because during his auctions, he does spot deals where he says, if you type this in right now, whoever gets it first gets it. And that, and that day, I just kicked butt and won all three. He had three, I won all three. And as we know, I love to do this. I love the sound. Let's do a ting, let's do a, let's do a ding noise for, the, for everybody real quick, because I love to do that. So here we go. Love that. <laughs> I love that. So... Okay, so that is it for the coins today. I hope you enjoyed. Let me do a quick show off one more time of our friend John Wayne, whose coin I absolutely, I love this coin. This is absolutely beautiful. I love the way they colorize it. It's just perfect. You just colorize the person and nothing else. That is just fantastic. I mean, I mean, tell me what you think. Do you like the colorized one better or do you like the silver one better? Let me know. I'm, I'm curious. Some people like this stuff. Some people like colorization. Some don't. But on ones like this, I love it. I love it because they didn't colorize the whole coin. They only colorized the one part they needed to. And if it shows, and look at the details. Look, I mean, look how much better the details look in the colorization. I just think it looks cool. So anyway, that is the big uh, reveal today, <laughs> or the new coins. So I hope you, I hope you liked them. There's one, two, three. And then we've got, uh, that's it. So that is it. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the video. And, and on tomorrow's video, we are going to check out a Roman coin because you voted for it. So that's what you're going to get. You're going to see uh, a double Neris Roman coin that's 1,750 years old. So with that, have a wonderful Sunday. And I'll see you all on Monday. Aloha and mahalo.